All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today. If you have any questions during the session, please submit them by using the Q&A button at the top of the interface. Those questions will be answered at the end or throughout. This email will be recorded, sorry, this webinar will be recorded and you'll receive um, a copy of it delivered to your email account. I hope you enjoy the webinar and I'll now hand you over to our experts, uh, Brooke Croning, Senior Software Engineer at the Cube Company and Thomas Hartman, Senior Software Engineer also at the Cube Company. Over to you guys. Thanks, Salah. Thank you. Yeah, this is the webinar about Qt Design Studio. The topic is turn your sketch code, uh, uh, your UI designs into code with Qt Design Studio. The main part will be a demo. Yeah, as Salah already announced us, it's Brooke and myself. I'm Thomas Hartmann. And yeah, the agenda is we will start with uh, small introduction about Qt Design Studio, and then we will go to the hands-on part, with a, which is uh, getting started with the sketch bridge and uh, Qt Design Studio. So it's mostly about how to export your designs from sketch to Qt Design Studio and then work on them. And after that, I will give a small um, introduction about the new features from Qt Design Studio 1.3. Qt Design Studio 1.3 was released last week on Wednesday. After that, I will give a show, small glimpse of a couple of things that are upcoming, and then we will have a Q&A session in the end. Yeah, um, you might know about the Qt framework that contains of Qt, Qt widgets, QML, and all the nice parts, and that's a very powerful uh, framework for C++. And with QML, we already have a nice addition that also caters to and parts front-end developers that are more familiar with JavaScript, um, but what we always saw and still see is that there's a huge gap in the market in between, or not a gap in the market, there's a huge um, issue with the workflow when um, designers are involved. So once you have a designers in the team, there's a really big gap between the design team and the developing team. The handoff from the designers to the developers is usually something like a sketch file but maybe even just a PowerPoint, just uh, images. And um, yeah, the communication between the development teams and design teams are often not perfect. Uh, change requests are really hard. And um, what we end up in the end um, is often not that close to design anymore. There's no way the designers can influence the development process and so on and so on. And the idea of Qt Design Studio is um, to see, to sit in this gap between the UI design and the development. So it's a tool that can be used by both parties, by the designers and by the developers. With QML, we have a unified language for both the designers and the developers. Both can work with the same tool. The delivery from the designers to the developer can actually be QML. So they can basically do the export process from their favorite tool, is whether it's Photoshop or Sketch. We will see that today. They can improve on that. They can even create prototypes on top of that, Sketch uh, uh, click dummies and so on. They can even run those on, fine, on hardware, deploy them to some degree, test them to some degree, and then that they can basically hand off that to developers and work iteratively on the QML project, on the QML code in Qt Design Studio together with the developers. Yes, um, another strong feature is uh, componentization. QML uh, has the concept of components and those components can be created either by designers or by developers and then they can be shared throughout the project. Um, yeah, that makes it easier to ensure consistency, right? And another uh, benefit from the tooling point of view is that with all the easy to use tools, we're talking about the timeline, the form editor, and so on. It's easy to create pixel-perfect screens, pixel-perfect animations, and that can be done by the designers. So the, basically the designer is then responsible for the quality and for the exact delivery, and it's not like he creates a mock-up, uh, a sketch, and then that is handed over to the developer and he has to redo it. Yeah, what are the key benefits of this? What is the value proposition of Qt Design Studio? It's uh, definitely faster iterations. It's also improved predictability. I will talk about that a bit. And yeah, that results in lower costs. 
So yes, faster iterations, since the designers and the developers can work more closely together, change requests are easier. Um, generally, uh, Visivik editor makes uh, designing it easier, uh, and so on. And, and this makes it, it make iterating a lot faster. Another thing is that we have the same code, potentially on the desktop, on embedded and mobile. Uh, we have the QML code and we use that for to validate the designs, maybe in a design phase, prototyping phase, but we can run that easily already on the final target hardware. And that is really uh, where um, the predictability is a lot improved because if a design by its designer can immediately be tested on the final hardware, yeah, we can test for things like resolutions, screen sizes, um, the, the d details of the display, are the colors correct? Do I have to change my color scheme? Is the performance okay, right? And all of this is basically done in early phases and not just basically very late in the process where then the change requests that come from from the real implementation of the real hardware basically change the design and maybe even destroy the design again. Yeah, and all of this allows us to lower the costs. We can keep the schedules. We avoid costly surprises like, okay, uh, actually our color scheme doesn't work with the final hardware or uh, the color depth is not high enough for design we originally envisioned or the performance is not correct. We cannot deliver the design. Yes, <clears throat> and yeah. All in all, we have a vision for our cute design studio um, that we provide an effective and lean workflow. And this is basically what this webinar is about today. And we concentrate on Sketch, but we also have a plugin for Photoshop at the moment. And we might concentrate on other plugins for other tools in the future, but for now it's Photoshop and Sketch. Um, yeah, the rapid prototyping with fast iterations, I talked about that, right? Um, you basically can go seamless from prototypes to the real product with QML and Qt. That's an awesome big advantage. Yeah, and you have common tools and a common language, which is Qt Design Studio and QML. Yeah, and now let's get started. I will basically now give over to Brooke and he will basically show you the workflow and then give a bit of meat into what I theoretically described until now. <laughs> okay, thanks Thomas. Let's just quit out of Keynote for now. And uh, let's start by taking a look at Sketch. So I'm not sure how familiar people are with Sketch. It's a design tool, a sort of vector graphic design tool. Quite popular these days, especially for this type of UI design and, and screen design, app design. Um, now, one of the nice things about Sketch is to start with the way that you can organize your work. So it has this concept of pages. Um, and this is my workflow and it's a, it's a good workflow. It's not, you know, the only type of workflow there is, but it's certainly one that I would recommend. So in my case, what I have is I have a, a full page full of artboards where I'm just sketching, where I'm just putting down ideas on the page, um, playing around with things and sort of seeing how they look. And, and in this case, you can see on all these artboards, everything's unorganized, unlabeled, just really stream of consciousness design work. And uh, when I find something I like, then what I do is I copy it over to this other page, which is all my components. And here you can see, you know, with these components here, that uh, everything's labeled nicely, everything's organized, and this is where I actually prepare everything for exporting into Design Studio. Um, what we, you know, and the way that we do that, let's have a quick look at the bridge plugin itself, is using the Qt bridge plugin. Now this is part of the package at the snapshot. So if you've downloaded Design Studio, the commercial version, you actually have this already and you just have to install it and then you can start using it. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, how many people will have used the Photoshop plugin or seen the previous webinars, but essentially uh, most of the options are exactly the same. So important stuff is the QML IDs and the export type. The QML type, imports and properties, I'm not actually gonna look at that much today. We covered them a lot in the previous Photoshop webinar, and these are sort of an advanced use for the plugin. And today I kinda of wanna to stick to the basics and show people how, that, how to get up and running if they have never used any kind of Qt framework stuff at all before. So the most important thing is you have these sort of export options. Um, at the moment, because it's a, an artboard itself, it can only be a component, that means a QML file, or it can be skipped. If it's an element of it, then 
at the moment it'll say it can't because it's actually in a skipped artboard. So you know what, let's just set that one to component just for the example here. And then choose something inside. And there you see now I have the options to set it as a child, which means an individual item of that QML component file merged. Everything that's merged will be pushed together into one image layer or skipped. Um, we'll look at that in a bit more detail for now. But what I wanted to show is one of the new features in the Sketch plugin. And this was completely missing from the Photoshop plugin before. And I don't know if any, again, if anyone saw this in the previous versions. But you would have to click through every single artboard one by one, changing your export type for every single layer. Now with Sketch, we have multi-selection available. So I can just drag that selection rectangle around all of my components, hit skip, and that's gonna skip all of my design concept work that's not part of the project. Um, and that won't be in my design studio project, so that won't be cluttering anything up. Okay, but the really important stuff in Sketch is with the use of symbols. Now, symbols in Sketch are essentially just something that you draw or create and you set as a symbol. And what that means is later on, you can actually reference those symbols. You can put instances of, if them, uh, instances of them in your design. And instead of reproducing or duplicating all of your work, you will just have a, a instance of that symbol. Now this fits really well together with Design Studio's componentization concept. So what we've done is we've made it that symbols in Sketch are automatically components in Design Studio. So this switch, this dial, is a single QML component. And every time I use this dial in a project, it's gonna um, just create an instance of that component. And also with Sketch, one of the, the great things that we can do is we can actually allow overrides. And again, this fits perfectly with the aliases concept in Design Studio. So if I allow overrides for, for the text value, what that means is in each instance of that dial, I can override this text and that's gonna create automatically for us an alias in Design Studio. And I'm gonna show you what that means and how this works just in just a second. So what I've done is I've kind of prepared these two screens and these are gonna be the actual screens of my application. And I can show you how, how to insert a symbol. You just come up here, you go to the document symbols and everything I have labeled as a, as a symbol, which is in itself a QML file, a QML component, is accessible here. And I can just click it in, click it into my design. I can click in uh, like a frame or something like this. Great. And I can click in, yeah, yeah something like this, right? So I can build up all of my UI screens that are created from these components that I've defined already in my components page. And when I export that, I'm gonna have a, a screen that is a composition of all of those components together. So let's just do another one, and then we can uh, export that to Design Studio, and I'll show you a little bit of sort of prototyping tricks and tips from a designer's perspective. So again, we want that top menu. And this isn't gonna create a duplicate component, it's just gonna reuse that component that I've created before. And let's maybe have a small frame this time. Yeah, something like this here. And let's put a dial inside it here. Yeah. That looks pretty cool. Just sort of sample that up in there a bit, nice. Okay, and then let's create some copies of it. Okay, so now center those, all three of those up. Nice. And let's just add in a slider or something and we can play with that in Design Studio. Okay, now, as I was mentioning, we have these overrides, right? So this has the, the 500 text is just from the base component, but actually I want to override it all here. So let's just say this one is low, this one is mid, and this one here is high. And that's actually going to create an alias automatically in Design Studio. So I think that's fine for now. I think we can just export these into Design Studio, and then we'll take a look at that. I don't want to spend too much time because there are more features that Thomas was, is going to show later on as well. 
In this case, I didn't bother renaming any of the QML IDs myself. I just going to trust that the plugin is actually going to do all this for me. That's going to generate unique IDs for all my assets and uh, unique IDs for all my QML IDs. And I'm kind of happy with that because this is just a prototype. One of the new things that we do have with the Sketch plugin is the ability to actually now export SVGs. Now, this is something that's been requested from day one. Um, it wasn't possible with Photoshop, but we finally managed to kind of deliver that with Sketch. So instead of PNG assets, you can have all your assets as SVG, which I've set here. And we're going to flag the uh, compact SVG just to keep some space small. That's, you know, always a nice thing to do, actually, to sort of minimize your file sizes where possible. Now to export that, all I need to do is, is select a folder. I've got this, this folder here, create a new folder inside there. I'm just gonna call it export, select that folder, come back to the home and hit export. Now it might take a little while, depending on the complexity of your project. In you know, this case, it's, it's a relatively complex project. There's quite a lot of assets and components and different stuff. So it, you know, it has to generate all the metadata for that. And that's done. And we can go actually straight to that folder and have a look and you see now we have a folder full of all the SVGs that are used in this project. Okay. So that's the sort of sketch part done. Let's just go into Design Studio and we can import that. I'm going to create a new project, empty. I've already set that default folder as the same thing. So let's just call this webinar project. Leave everything else default for now. Don't need to worry about changing any settings. Now we're here in Design Studio. This is the, the design mode of Design Studio. First thing we're going to do is come into the Resources tab, add new resources, look for that export folder. And what we're interested in right now is this metadata folder. So this metadata folder here is going to tell Design Studio how it should create all of our files and assets and, and everything that we did in sketch. So if we hit open, that's going to take us to the importer panel. Um, and for now, we're going to leave the merging off because this is the first time that we're creating this project. But later on, if I have time, I'm going to actually show you how to do a merge as well. So let's just import the assets and generate the QML. Again, this can take a little while, depending on how complex your project is. And you see here that it's actually taking care to rename everything to a unique name, to a unique asset name and the IDs it will take care of as well. And you can see here that it's actually now writing all of these QML components. And it says here, you know, skipping the merge. And now it's done. And you can see all of our SVG assets are already visible in our resource browser. So we can have a look and all of our components and files are all down here in our project browser. So let's take a look at those screens we created. Okay, so let's zoom out a little bit. Great, so you see this screen got created here and it's just put these components in, in the right place, exactly where I'd position them in Sketch. Um, now actually I wanna work on this one because I wanna show you a couple of prototypey tricks that you can do in Design Studio as a designer to get your stuff up and running fast. So let's start with this slider. Okay, so here's the slider component. Let's go inside that component. And what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna create an animation of the slider working and we're gonna use another slider to actually control it as a sort of uh, you know prototyping approach to the design. So to do that, we're going to need a quick control. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to drop the quick control slider into the item here. And let's just use the layout to fill up that slider. And a couple of things we want to change. We want to change the value to zero. So it goes all the way back to the beginning here. And we want the slider to have the same range as our uh, timeline. So let's make that zero to a thousand with a step size of one. And then finally, we're gonna set the opacity to zero. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but these are all new Quick Controls 2 based desktop controls for Design Studio. So we have all these nice integrated sliders and uh, a lot of features that were not there before. So we, you know, we can just drop that opacity down. We don't actually need to see the slider. We're gonna use it invisibly to drive the other one. So let's create a timeline. Um, Everything is fine, default, default 1,000 frames. But let's get rid of that animation. 
and we want to get rid of the animation so that we can actually use this expression here. So we're just going to say slider one dot value slider slider one dot value, and that's going to bind our timeline to this invisible slider. And this will make sense in a minute. Okay, so now let's start doing some animation. Let's take this handle component and you know, right at the end, that's already in the right position. So let's say, insert keyframe in the X position here and go all the way back here and just drag this along. And then do the same, set another keyframe. Great. So now the slider handle is animated. And let's do the same with this foreground. You see, we've got this kind of foreground that, that, that will fill with the slider. Um, and again, that width is correct for the end. So let's insert a keyframe for the end. You can see that there. Right back at the beginning. And now we can actually, you know, either use the, the spin box control or we can just drag it this way with the form editor. Click it there. Insert the keyframe here. We'll save that. Come back up to the main screen. Let's just hit the live preview button. So I know that the live preview is a bit big for this. So we can scale it down, use the scaling factor. Look, there you see, interactive slider, two minutes, no coding, using my original design as the basis for that slider. Okay. All right, now let's do the same for the dial. And then once we've done that, we'll do one merge. We should still have time. And then I'm going to pass back over to Thomas. So let's go into this dial component. We're going to do something very, very similar for this. Let's just uh, zoom in a little bit on the dial. In this case, we're going to need a couple of things. So we're going to want the quick controls as well. And we're also going to want an arc item from the studio components. And um, let's just start by dragging this dial in. So we're gonna drag a dial, do the same thing, go to the layout, fill our item so that it fills it up completely. We want the same range, so we want, you know, 0, 0, 1,000, 1. And then again, we're gonna drop the opacity down to zero because we don't actually need to see it. Now what we need to do is put in a arc item that we're going to animate that looks, you know, that's, that's our design for the dial. So let's grab a studio arc, drop that in. Same thing, we'll use the layout to fill it. And in a minute, we'll actually use the margins to position it a bit better. Um, and now we can actually fiddle with this a little bit. I don't know if anyone remembers the previous controls, but, you know, before you'd have to actually click up and down for every single sort of 0.1%. And it was a real, real time, time suck. Um, but now we have these new controls and we have features like this. You can just click and drag the control itself. Much nicer. Refresh it to get it up to date in the view. Yeah, I think that's okay. Let's give it a round cap. There's another new feature that we have here, which is good too. My mouse has got a bit sort of slidey. Oh, uh -huh. the dust on the lens. There we go. Now, let us also, let's give some margins in here. So let's stick a, you know, sort of small margin all the way around. Sort of center it up a bit in our design. So that just gives, you know, an offset margin to the, to the group that it's, a, that it's filling. Okay, and same again, we need a timeline. So we want a timeline. We don't want an animation. We want this one to be dial one dot value. Let's close that. Now let's animate this arc. So what we want to do is we're going to drag this beginning all the way back to the beginning of our arc here. Great. And we want to drag the end to the end of the arc here. And then that's the end of the, the end of the animation. So let's put a keyframe in there. It's not the beginning or the end. That's the beginning. Yeah. And a keyframe in there. And then right at the beginning, the beginning is going to be the same because that stays the same. And it's just the end that we're going to use that control to scrub all the way back. Oh, 
overshot it a little bit. Let's just get it close here. And insert a keyframe. And you can actually see that the round cap hasn't been taken into uh, effect here. So, you know, prototypey design a solution to this. Let's uh, put some opacity keyframes in. Let's put an opacity keyframe of zero in here and just offset it really slightly and stick another opacity keyframe in here. Okay, so now we have this arc, dial arc here. And before we come back out to the next layer up, let's just do one thing. Let's take this stroke color, make it as an alias, and then we can change that color for the different iterations of our dial. So let's come back up here, take a quick look at this dial. Let's a little bit and look and you can see here this one on the right the dial label this was actually generated for us in sketch already so by using that override property in sketch we already have that alias for the text in place and i've just done the same thing manually here for the stroke color for the arc and i'm going to give all three arcs a different color so i'm going to have a red one for this one a green one for this one and a blue one for this one. I use some of the recent colors from, from before when I was testing. Okay, now if I run this in live preview, now you're gonna see that these arcs are now interactive, right? So I've got my lows, my mids, my highs. I haven't typed in any code at all. I've just used the design tools and I've prototyped my whole design up in a way that I could at least hand this over to a, to a developer and say, this is how I want it to be in the real, in the real iteration. And you know, that just took me sort of 10, 15 minutes to get that far. So it really is a very fast, very fluid workflow. Okay, um, so final thing I'd like to show now, we've just got about time, is a merge. Now, I already know that there's gonna be an error when I do this merge, but I still wanna show you that anyway, because I think it's useful to design, for designers to understand that you know, error messages are not something they need to be afraid of. There's, there's always generally something you can do about it. So let's just change some stuff, right? Let's change this background. I've got a different background style here. Nice. And uh, let's go and change some of the actual dial stuff. I think I already created some alternate color schemes for this stuff. Yeah, right, okay. So now let's look at that. Okay, so the client came back and they said, hey, you're, we like it, but your design's really boring and, and we want it more colorful. I can go back into Sketch, I can change the colors of my original design, and I can just re-export that into Design Studio. And actually what it's gonna do is it's gonna merge it together with the work I already did in Design Studio. So all the interaction I prototype, that's still gonna be there. And we just changed the, the actual SVG assets and the style of the design. So let's just re-export the whole project. It's gonna say, shall I overwrite that metadata file? We say, yes, that's fine. Takes a minute to do it, but you know. It's done. Let's go back to Design Studio, come to Resources, we'll go back and we're going to re-import again. So we want that metadata file again. And we'll open that up. And the only difference this time is we're going to tick Merge QML. So that means it's actually going to read through all the QML and try and decide what came from Sketch and what came from Design Studio. And we want to keep everything that changed in Design Studio, but we want to reintegrate all the new Sketch information. So let's do that. Hit merge. It takes a little bit of time. It's doing the same thing again. We're sort of renaming the assets. And when it starts writing the QML, give it a moment and then I'll scroll down. And you can see there that this time it's actually merging the QML. So this time it's reading through all the old files, comparing them with the new files, merging together what it can, writing a new component. Um, and yeah, and that can take a little bit of time. There's some really complex stuff happening behind the scenes there, but it's already done in our case. And you can already see that it's updated all my design behind. However, I know there is a little error. Aha, uh -huh. okay. 
it can't open the document because there's an error in the QML file. It doesn't like my uh, property name, so it doesn't like my alias property. Hmm. Okay, so we go back into the code and it says that's an invalid property name in my arc, but we know we added that before, right? So let's just carefully go into the edit mode, which is a bit of a safer mode for debugging things. Open up the dial. All right, for some reason it dropped the alias. Now this is probably a bug from our side that we need to fix, but I just wanna show people that, you know, even if you get an error, it's not the end of the world. You can just come back in, put that alias back in, right? Go back to the main screen. Oh, not that one, main screen two. Hey, no problem, fixed. Run that live preview. That's my live preview gone. Oh, I've got my, my Zoom toolbars in the way. There we go. And here we go, look. All my interaction, or everything I did before, that's all still in place. And I've just been able to go back into Sketch, change my design, re-export it. I haven't lost any of my work in Design Studio. Okay, so that's all I want to show you today. That's, I think, a very good start for um, beginners in, in Sketch and beginners in Design Studio. And I hope that's given you the, the uh, enthusiasm and the confidence to go out there and start creating your first real interactive designs with Design Studio. And with that, I'm going to pass back over to Thomas, who's going to go through some of the new features of Design Studio. Would you like me to close that project? And, yeah. Yeah, all right. Thanks so enough, let's just quit out of this project. And Thomas is yeah. going to take over from here. Maybe it's right. now time to answer a couple of sketch-related questions. I think that's a good time to answer a couple of them. So the first question is um, whether Sketch is available on Windows 10. Unfortunately, it's not. That's not our, under our control. No, Sketch so, is Mac OS <laughs> only. So unfortunately, if you are a Windows user, for now, you're going to have to stick with Photoshop. But maybe in the future, there'll be another solution that's equally as good as Sketch that we can offer you. Is it possible to use sketch symbols that are defined in a separate document? Um, at the moment, I don't think it is. I think you have to use the, the actual ones from within your design document. Um, but this is definitely something that we're looking into, and I hope that that's something that in the next release we will actually support sketch libraries, so yes. you know, fully importable sketch libraries. So the idea is that if you have QML components, you can create uh, libraries in sketch for them. Yeah, and uh, generally you can have sketch libraries and um, also basically they don't have to be part of the same project, but I think the even more powerful approach is that, for example, you can make our controls available in sketch or your version of, right. your styled version of our controls available in sketch um, with all the metadata, the annotations that basically tell uh, the air bridge in which types they have to turn those symbols and then you can create very powerful designs already in Sketch and export them to your design studio with any problems. Yep. 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 Okay. Um, does the Sketch plugin work with Sketch symbols that are in an external master library? Okay, so that's the same, same question again. At the moment it doesn't, but hopefully in the future it will. That's something that we're working on right now. Uh, can you cover some of the hotkeys you've been using? I didn't use any hotkeys at all. I used everything that I did was from within side the design studio user interface so inside the property panel you have this little nut um, in the controls that allows you to do all this insert keyframes and i'm pretty sure that thomas will cover that because the new controls are one of the things that he's actually going to uh, uh, cover in a minute when he talks about the controls um, Okay, should we, can we, should we move on a little bit? We'll come back to some of these questions or do you want to just wrap this one, these yeah, ones up? We can wrap them up for now, All I right. think, and then just go on. Uh, what is the price of Cute Design Studio? It's Cute Design Studio professional version is included in the commercial license. So it's not something that you have to buy extra. Um, however, if you don't want to do that, there is a community version of Design Studio, which is absolutely free to download and use. Trouble is you're not going to get the sketch bridge plugin in the commercial, in the, sorry, in the community version. So unfortunately the Sketch and Photoshop plugins are only for commercial users, but if you have a commercial developer license, then you are entitled to all of that Design Studio content as well. 
And as far as I know, there's also a license just for designers, but for details, just contact our sales department, right. our sales people. And right, right. Yeah, we're you know, not the experts in this stuff, so I would definitely recommend to inquire with, with, with our sort of sales and, and inquiries department there. How are responsive layouts approached in Cute Design Studio? If we have layer resizing, positioning constraints set in Sketch, what happens in Design Studio with them? Um, at the moment, there is no conversion of sort of resize positioning in Sketch to Design Studio. Uh, as we can export SVGs from Sketch, then all of your content will, of course, be resizable, res restretchable. Um, for now, if you want to create responsive design, you have to do that part in Design Studio. We have incredibly powerful anchoring, positioning, layout systems in Design Studio. Um, and the idea is that you do your layouts in Sketch and then you do your, your actual kind of margins and grids and um, anchors and everything in Design Studio. Perhaps that's something in the future that we will actually be able to support importing from Sketch into Design Studio. Um, it's certainly something that we're very interested in. So let's see what we can we can do about that in the future as well. And, and that's uh, designs are a huge topic, but at this point in time, we don't convert what's in Sketch to our layout system because they are slightly different, but we have our own very, very powerful and time proven layout system. Yeah, um, that answers both of these questions here. And there's one more question that I'll answer now. Is Design Studio plugin available for Photoshop and Illustrator? Yeah, there is a Photoshop version that's already out there. You will be able to use that directly. There is a previous webinar that uh, I did about the, just about the Photoshop plugin, and that's on our YouTube channel. So if you're interested in Photoshop, go to our YouTube channel and you can see that previous webinar covering the Photoshop plugin. Uh, in the chat, what versions of Sketch do you support? Uh, always recommend using the latest. So if you've got a Sketch license, um, I know that you have to pay for updates, but at the moment, the only really tested versions are the, are the latest ones. Um, is the Qt SVG lib optimized in terms of memory footprint and performance? Yeah, I think that's what exactly what that kind of um, minified SVG is for. Yeah, but that's what Sketch is doing. So Sketch is creating, I think, an S tiny SVG. Tiny 1.1 or something. And, like that. Um, this is a big topic in, inside of the Qt framework, so I don't think we consider SVG as the, the ideal format for the final delivery on really low end hardware. So we call that asset conditioning. So in the future, there will be some conversion tool that will convert your SVG further to something that is smaller and faster to load. But at this point in time, uh, we use tiny SVG as it comes out of Sketch. And yeah, I mean, that's absolutely fine for, for desktop stuff, for prototyping, for most stuff. But if you really are into optimization, then you might want to take that a step further from that prototype design into really conditioned, you know, optimized assets. Okay, um, I really think we should move on. I think that Thomas has got a lot of interesting stuff to show you. So let's just crack on with that then. Yes. Let's uh, spin around and swap positions. So what I want to do is just show you the, the feature we introduced with Qt Design Studio 1.3. So I'm kind of assuming you are already familiar at least a bit um, with the Qt Design Studio. I just created a new project. We call it webinar. Best ever. So I create a new project. So <clears throat> and then as um, Brooke already hinted, uh, I think the most work for this release went into the property editor. So while it still kind of resembles the property editor we had before, the UI was like, there's like really a lot of changes in the visual appearance. Brooke did a lot of work there. I think the, the new layout looks a lot cleaner and nicer. The new controls look a lot cleaner and nicer. But under the hood, we changed from Qt Quick Control 1s to Qt Quick Control 2. So we are actually using QML for that and changing from the controls 1 to 2 was a big step. And uh, when, while we are doing that, we were also introducing lots of small features like these integrated sliders. Um, another really nice thing is this, uh, being able to drag the, the, the spin boxes uh, when clicking them, that's kind of known from 3D tools, but it's really nice to do certain kind of adjustments. So let's just reset that. And you should spend a lot of work on the color editor. So we now save the recent colors. 
Uh, I will show that a bit more in detail. Um, let me just show you a small, very small presentation. Um, so we have this text label here, and let's copy that a few times. So we create a few copies of this text label, like say four, and we have four copies. And now I will show a bit of layouting. So we lay out them, actually position them in this case, just in a row. So we put them in a small layout, so to say. And now we will zoom in a bit. Actually, I won't zoom in a bit. I want you show, to show you one of the main features we added in this release, and this is multi-selection for the property editor. This was really missing before. So I now selected all the text labels, and now I select the size, and I say something like 32. And you see all of them get bigger. Really nice. Um, let's go to the color. Let's give them all maybe the green here, but I can also do a, now have an integrated dialogue, color dialogue from Mac here, where you can use actually the color picker and pick this black, for example. Um, we have the original old colors. We have all the colors we recently used. Also, this was polished a lot. So these are small things, that, but they have a huge impact, impact on productivity. Um, yeah, let's center that a bit. So now you see this, hello, hello, hello. Um, we also now have a gradient library, for example. Uh, let's have a nice gradient in here apply close so now you have a gradient and you can extend that gradient library with your own gradients um, not fiddly and cumbersome before now it's really easy i create create add resources here now i have to scroll down and i have some folder here with our font and i said let's say i choose this font i click okay and i put it into the font sub directory of my project, click OK. Okay, now the prod font is added to my project. Now I again select all my text labels and go to this combo box here and you see that Tilium Web shows up here. I click on it and now they have all Tilium Web and that's really nice. Um, while we have this explicit font editing, um, that's very impor uh, important to understand that one of our main targets is still embedded and on embedded, you basically have to keep track of all the fonts in your projects, right? And that's why we put them into the project. They are part of the delivery and they are installed then on the far hardware you deploy to. And yeah, but I think it's really easy now to add new fonts to your project. Um, oops, twenty. And I think, yeah, and the multi-selection, I already see that in the, in the chat. Yeah, that's a really, really, really powerful and important feature um, and was cumbersome before and we are really happy to have it now. Another feature I want to show you is, uh, let's assume I add now, well, just a white rectangle. I'm not a designer, so it doesn't look so beautiful when I do stuff. And now I actually created a small animation here and yeah, I make it continuous and I make it ping pong. This is basically just for playing around. So I turn on the record button, move it somewhere up here, go to the end of the animation, still have the record button now and go down here and turn off the record button and I'll go back and forth. And you see, yeah, that was working before, right? That's nothing new. We have this animation created, but now what we have, and that's really powerful, we have this curve editor that is more like similar um, tools in Lee, really powerful 3D tools. And here you now see the actual line in this case, the actual curve for the X and Y uh, coordinates and how they basically behave in time. I can see them in parallel. And now I can also work in that viewer. Can I go, for example, insert a new keyframe here, insert a new keyframe here. I move because both of them selected, both of them got one. Um, I can now move around this keyframe. Okay, you see it's already up, also updated here in the timeline. Oops. Oops. Let's go back to the curve editor. Here. Um, and yeah, I can really tweak this animation now, right? And I can also now say, okay, I want the handles. I want this like real busier curves. And then let's say I also want to control, for example, I want to control uh, the tangent here, right? I really want like, basically that it slows down to nearly a standstill in the middle for the uh, X 
uh, animation and now we go to the white animation and kind of do something similar. Um, yep. Oops, it's not selected, yes. So I do something similar. Yeah, let's keep it like that. Move that to the side a bit. And now we can look at the side at the live preview. Right. And you really see, yeah. And I can still continue to to tweak this in our graph editor. Let's quit preemptor. We don't need that. So, so now you go yep. side by side. I'm fighting still a bit with the Mac window manager here. And most are mostly working on Windows, to be honest. Um, but yeah, now let's change this tangent. This is what I want to show. And you immediately see how the animation changes. I can move around this keyframe, see how it affects the animation. And that is really, I mean, for, for certain kind of animations, that is yeah, different of day and night to have these tools. So if you really want to have powerful animations, micro animations in your application, then this is, this is really the tool. If um, you just want to have small, simple animations, the old timeline is still there. And I think it's still really nice uh, to use it. Now I want you one, to show you one more thing, which I think is really cool. It's upcoming, it's not out there. I will generate a, a resource file, we call it. That's a file that contains all the assets, all the assets for this project. And I put that into a cloud. It's already in the right folder. Yeah, it's all good, it's all I just save it. That's now just created basically a file with a certain suffix that contains all everything that's part of this project. And now the cool thing comes, I go to Safari and I can click here. And now I get go again to this folder. And I open it. Oh. Oops. Oops. I don't know. Okay. Why can't I do that? Interesting. So uh, we just recently updated this web page. So probably there is some problem with the web page. But what now should happen is that I should have a preview. And what definitely works is I can show you we have the examples here. So they run. So we have to wait a bit because now it's compiling the, the WebAssembly application. So that's a web viewer based on WebAssembly. And now it's compiling that component and it's loading the QML file in there. And then we will be able to, uh, to preview basically what we did uh, on the live preview. Yeah, and unfortunately this thing is online. So there was some regression now, so the upload doesn't work of new files, but you see it's super fluent and you can basically, it's basically an online QML viewer where you basically can uh, you know, just preview your designs. And, um, yeah, that's a super powerful feature to, to basically share your designs throughout an organization, right? So you basically create your, your QML project file, send it around, and then you use either our web view that we will eventually put online or your internal one. You can also modify this template that it always basically shows the current state of, of your design. And yeah, you can do that on the web, right? So there's no additional infrastructure needed whatsoever. And yeah, stay tuned. We don't know exactly when this will be totally ready, but we are planned to have this basically online pretty soon. And I think it's a really nice addition. Another thing which is a bit further away, but I also want to show you because it's will also come Just, uh, is open, file. open file or project. Yes. Um, that's also prepared. Uh, that's our a demo here that's called car 3d and i open that and maybe you already saw the the blog post about Qt quick 3d and actually sorry. oops sorry i was confused here yeah here it is so maybe you already saw the blog post about Qt quick 3d and this basically is Qt quick 3d running already in the live preview you just have this car which was converted and the car is actually a component here. We can go inside that component. When we do that, we don't have a live preview any, anymore. That's one of the limitations. I mean, this is still in, in alpha stage, but you have access to the whole DOM of the car. You can access all the properties. You can do changes, you can do tweaks. You can go back here. 
Um, actually, things like changing the light is already possible. So we, let's change the light to blue. So now we have a diffuse lightning of in blue and could also use this nice, nice cutish green. This is already working. And yeah, this will make it really easy to integrate uh, 3D content into Qt Band Studio. Yep. Yep, um, that's I think is from our side, uh, I think. Thank you for the intention. Um, yeah. We got any more questions? Thanks for watching for the webinar and we will continue with the Q&A session. Yes. Okay. Um, so somebody asks if we can add the font via drag and drop. Um, nope, at the moment you actually still have to import it like a resource via the resource importer. And again, because there is magic going on behind the scenes, that is the mechanism that uh, works for now. But it's something that we'll look into, and I'm sure. Yes, something and we we'll consider uh, for all. Let's you might do that. It's just a matter of priorities um, for all resources to enable basically to add them by drag and drop. Right, any resource that has a very specific ending, like the files from all bridges, fonts, and so on, very easy to detect, even images, and then a uh, dialog pops up. And yep. Okay. Um, does Cute Designer help if we use? Cute widget only instead of QML. No, this is not a really tool for designing QML. Yes, this is still yeah, it's a tool for QML, not for cute widgets. Um, no, um, I think the answer is simply no. Sorry nope. about that. Yeah. Um, okay. Well. Yeah, so we've got a little bit more time for questions still um, before we go offline. So feel free to type your, we'll wait for a little bit longer and then we'll, we'll finish the webinar here. Is there anything in the chat function? Uh, any questions there? Um, no, I think there was the one that we answered earlier about um, Qt's SVG library and uh, somebody celebrating the inclusion of multi-selection in Design Studio, which again, I'm absolutely in agreement with. That was uh, sorely missing. And now it's there, it makes your life a hell of a lot easier as a designer. Particularly. It has drawbacks, <laughs> kind of a bit, because now it's easier to not use componentization to share properties, right? You cannot basically duplicate your font on every text label and it, you make it easier now with multi-selection. But so keep in mind that you should prefer components basically over copy and pasting and setting the same properties on everything. But I mean, you totally understand that people also do and want to do prototyping in Qt Design Studio. Not everything is cleaned up from the beginning. And especially in this stage, it's an extremely useful uh, feature. Yeah, I agree. I think we've got okay, one more um, question, yeah. Yeah, it's another question. Would you recommend to move to QML if we have already developed our application entirely in Qt widgets? Uh, it's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, there are advantages to QML, um, especially if you are, if what's required is a heavy focus on design itself, then QML. Yes, I mean, it's definitely not an answer we can give a clear yes to. It de totally depends on the scope. And um, also, if, for example, you ever want to target embedded and touch devices where QML really excels, QML has a couple of advantages and we use it ourselves quite a lot now in the design studio. And I think the property editor really shows how nice uh, QML can work on the desktop, but porting from Qt widget to QML is a lot of work. So if you have a huge application, that is a huge effort and the user might not immediately see the differences. But um, if you, for example, want to do a tablet port anyway, then it's at least something to consider. And you can also move over gradually. Like um, not everything in Qt Design Studio is done in QML. So the, the timeline is not, and the navigator is not, the item library is, the property editor is. So you can mix it, so you can move gradually. Yep. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, can you see the organized components inside Design Studio? How can you have an overview on all components inside a project? Well, That's a very good point. Um, at this point in time, here. yeah, we have, we have our two small components listed here. That's not good. And I think if you compare to Sketch, we still lack there. And that's something actually that has very, very high priority. Right. So I don't want to promise too much here, but I think um, having a better overview on, of, on components and having some 
view to show all the components embedded in your current projects or that are even linked in from other projects is, is a, a huge, uh, a huge uh, topic. Right now, basically, the entry point for components is the item library, and you can have your custom items and all of this. Um, but you don't have what we saw in Sketch, where you basically see visually see all the components that are part of this specific project. I think right. this is and that, but you know that would be really nice. Uh, this 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 sort of concept of having pages of of having one page which is an overview of all of your components. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps a better way to insert these components into your design. At the moment, you just sort of drag them from your QML component on, onto the form editor. Mm -hmm. But maybe either with a sort of context menu insert components and definitely with this separate view of all of your components, this sort of page approach is something that we're looking into. We're, we're really trying to kind of um, move Design Studio in a way that is familiar for people coming from other tools who are used to these quality of life features that yes. we would like to, of course, have those as well. But there's another question in, about the differences between the community version and the commercial version. And the question is whether just a sketch bridge is missing. That's kind of true. Uh, but not entirely the sketch bridge is missing, the Photoshop bridge is missing because those are commercial tools and we invested quite a lot of uh, work to support them and we want to keep that commercial only for now. Another feature that is missing are the so-called ISO icons. That's a huge uh, library of ISO icons of, of uh, standardized industry standard, industry standard icons that we cannot share for legal issues and therefore they are also not part of the community edition. But however, everything else is there. So the curve editor, the timelines, um, all of the new controls, uh, you know, there's an awful lot of stuff that is in the community yes. edition. So it's certainly not, um, you know, it, it is of interest to people who are still getting into Design Studio who maybe just want to have a check and see if it fits for them, if they like the, the approach. Um, and really the only thing I think people are going to miss a lot is the bridge plugins yeah. to start with. Yeah, it's not crippled at all and uh, yeah. Um, okay, there's one more question up there. Can Cube Design Studio handle text and object styles? Um, I'm not sure if that means from Sketch or sort of internally in itself. Uh, yeah. It does to a certain extent, both with Photoshop and Sketch, match the, the, the sort of cut font um, and styles applied to the text in Sketch. Um, we don't have a way of managing styles inside Design Studio just yet, but it's definitely on the roadmap as well, again, to have this ability to-, I mean, to Typically in QML, what you do is something like that. I drag my text label in there. I make it a bit bigger, 24. Maybe I make it white because I like white. And now I have this text label, and then the most nat nat uh, natural step would be to turn that into a component and call that component maybe my label. Um, and now this, my label uh, basically uh, pops up here in the item library and now I can drag in as many of these labels as I want. And I can always go back into that thing. I go into component here, oops. Select it in the property editor. Now say, hmm, okay, maybe I want it different font. So maybe we want Telium Web here, and maybe we want to have it a bit bigger. And bold. And then we go back, and now every instance that would have used this label would change. Right, and so we definitely have the mechanisms to do it. Um, I think what we could improve on is the UI and having a way to actually manage these these sort of component text styles inside Design Studio that leverages the powerful yeah. componentization we have. You know, and, and as we showed in the example, you could make some of these properties alias properties and override them in the way that Sketch handles mm -hmm. um, symbol overrides as well. So there is a very nice uh, mapping between Sketch and Design Studio, and I think between these design tools in general and the way that we see modern design, the approach to modern design work happening in the real world. And of course, we want to make sure that Design Studio is as compatible with that as possible. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that might be it. 
Um, we've we've um, definitely hit the hour mark, haven't we? Yeah, just on time. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Brooke and Thomas, for your um, presentation and demoing. Very insightful. Um, and thanks everyone for joining. If you if there are any more questions that you um, kind of pops into head after the webinar, please send us an email at info at cute.ii and we'll answer them for you. Uh, but yeah, like I said, thank you very much. And until next time, goodbye. Thank you very much, Salah. Thanks for hosting Thank and see you soon. See you. Bye. Yeah. Bye.